Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Net Network and I'm also representing openchannels.org, um, the MPA News and the Marine Ecosystems and Management Newsletter. I'd like to welcome all of you to today's webinar. Um, I we my organizations are we're very pleased to be uh, assisting with and co-coordinating today's Panorama uh, Blue Solutions webinar. Um, before we get started, I wanted to go through a few technical aspects. Um, first of all, we really encourage you to ask questions during the webinar, and the, we will have a dedicated question and answer uh, session at the end of the webinar after the formal presentations, but you are welcome to send questions in throughout the webinar, and as well as during the question and answer session. You do this by typing the questions into the question panel of your user interface. That's the uh, the go-to webinar um, pop-up window. And so there should be a question panel and you just type in the questions and then one of the moderators will relay those questions to the presenters. Um, and if you have any other technical issues or, or, or uh, logistical questions, feel free to also send those in through the questions panel as well as any comments you have. Um, and if you are unable to use the questions panel for any reason, uh, please send me an email and hopefully you can see my email up at the bottom of the slide, up, which is ebmtools at natureserve.org. And I'll turn you over for the, uh, the formal presentation now. Volker? Yes, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, welcome everybody to our Panorama Solutions for a Healthy Planet webinar. We will talk today about certification of small-scale fisheries in development countries and discuss opportunities and challenges. My name is Volker Koch. I work for the global project Blue Solutions of the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, the GIZ. And I'm here with Ronja Schmidt, who helped me a lot in setting up the, the whole webinar. So in this webinar, we will try to showcase different examples how certification and other approaches can work to improve sustainability of small-scale fisheries in development countries. And let me walk you quickly through the agenda. Um, first, I will be introducing the Blue Solutions Project and the Panorama Solutions for a Healthy Planet Partnership. And after that, we will have keynote remarks from Audun Lem from the FAO. And after that, we will have three solutions presented. If uh, in your original invitations, there were only two, but we're welcome, uh, welcoming Daniel Sudeby from Ocean Outcomes as a third one. And our first solution will be by Camila Zambrano Esguerra from Fondo Acción, second one by Hoyt Peckham from Smartfish, and the third one, as I said, from Daniel Sudeby. After the presentations, which should take about 40 minutes, 40 to 50 minutes, we will have a question, answer and discussion section. So please use the question panel as, uh, and all the questions we cannot uh, answer during the webinar, we will refer them to our presenters afterwards so they can respond to you via email for that. And after a short wrap up, we're done. So, um, Blue Solutions is a global project that's financed by the International Climate Initiative of the BMUB, the German Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation, Building and Nuclear Safety. It is led by the GIZ, Grid Arendal in the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and UN Environment. Blue Solution provides a global platform to collate, document, share and generate knowledge and capacity for sustainable management and equitable governance of our planet. Our objective is to support the achievement of the marine and coastal Aichi targets of the Convention for Biological Diversity and the Sustainable Development Goals of the Agenda 2030, specifically SDG 14, Life Below Water. To accomplish this, we use different capacity development formats in cooperation with our partner institutions. We seek to enhance capacities for scaling up success, to provide learning opportunities on blue solution themes and support policy processes. This webinar is one of these formats. 
We also offer three training courses on integrating ecosystem services into planning and management, another one on climate change adaptation, and one on marine spatial planning, a blue planning and practice course. We've conducted also a social lab and exchanges in regional fora and face-to-face -face meetings. We focus on, um, sorry, we focus on successful hands-on examples in marine and coastal conservation and sustainable use, or the blue solutions as we call them. We identify, document and promote these experience success stories and their core elements, the building blocks, support knowledge transfer and enable mutual learning and upscaling. So what qualifies for a blue solution? Basically, the solutions are tools, methods, processes or approaches that work, inspire action, and they must be thematically relevant. So they address real world challenges for conservation and sustainable development. They must be effective. So they have been implemented with demonstrated positive impact and they must be scalable. So elements of these solutions can be applied, maybe with modifications in other contexts, both geographically and thematically. The Panorama Solutions for a Healthy Planet web platform is a centerpiece of these efforts. And this graph shows a little bit how the whole knowledge transfer and learning process works. I won't go much into details here, but basically our solution providers offer their success stories to other people who want to solve problems in their own context, our solution seekers. We have different delivery mechanisms to bring these groups together, as I have explained above and to ensure effective learning and knowledge sharing. So currently on our marine and coastal portal, we have 103 solutions from five continents. And overall, there are 315 solutions in three different thematic portals on the platform. A fourth community will be starting up soon. It's called uh, Sustainable Agriculture for Biodiversity. So so the good news is we are growing fast. Now, back to the topic for today's webinar. Um, we will have a look now at the challenge to make small scale fisheries more sustainable and we'll discuss certification and also other means that can improve both economic and ecological sustainability, depending on the context and scale. Today, most certified fisheries are large scale and come from industrialized countries. The main benefit is often not so much a price premium, but access to markets for these fisheries. Apparently, the economic benefits stay mostly with the retailers in the end, while the producers absorb most of the costs. Obviously, large fisheries can do that easier through economies of scale. For small scale fisheries, this is difficult. And also, small scale fisheries are much more difficult to certify. They use they catch multiple species, use multiple gears, have multiple landing sites, cater to a variety of markets, and often are a mix of subsistence and commercial fishing. Lack of scientific data monitoring and also enforcement and insufficient fisheries management are further challenges. So for um, our keynote remarks, I would like to introduce Auden Lem. Auden is with the FAO since 1996. He's the deputy director of the Fishery and Aquaculture Policy and Resources Division. And he is also the secretary of FAO's subcommittee on fish trade, which is the main international body for discussion and recommendations on trade and market issues in the sector. Auden has a PhD in agricultural sciences from the Sea Fisheries Institute in Poland, a master in business administration from Harvard, and a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from the Norwegian School of Economics and Business Administration. So I'm really pleased to have Odin with us. Odin, if you would like to go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Volker. Thank you, Volker. And I hope now everyone can see my presentation on the screen. Yes, we can. Very good. Well, first of all, thank you for taking this initiative and for uh, placing this very important topic on the agenda, uh, not only dealing with the small scale sector, but the relationship to certification. 
I'll uh, talk about more, mostly about the context within which the certification uh, agenda has developed, uh, some of the challenges, um, and I will allude, uh, allude to uh, some of the solutions, but I know that there will be some wonderful case studies following that will go more into detail how uh, regional and national communities within the fish, uh, the small scale sector have dealt with the, uh, the challenges. But first, I'll give you some uh, facts about uh, fisheries, because I think not everyone that has uh, registered for the, um, for the webinar has uh, detailed knowledge about uh, the sector. So I'll just give a few overview slides setting the, some of the facts. Well, we all know that um, overall supply, overall production of fish and fishery products has increased tremendously over the last uh, decade. We know that the supply from capture fisheries have stabilized around 90 million tons. And we know that it's the aquaculture sector that has driven overall supply of uh, fish and fishery products to the world consumers. And overall now, uh, production has reached between 165 and 170 million tons. It's also very important to note that even though the aquaculture sector still is smaller than the capture fisheries uh, sector, in terms of consumption, in terms of what we eat of, of seafood from the sea, uh, the contribution from aquaculture is in fact larger now than from, from the world's oceans. So that is a breakthrough development which happened in 2014. Now, if we look at the, the people involved, we see that a tremendous amount of people are engaged directly and indirectly in the sector, about 56 million uh, people directly. We know that most of these are in Asia and in developing countries, but we also know that a large number of women are uh, engaged and part of the overall uh, workforce in the sector, especially in, in processing, uh, less than in, less in production, but especially processing and distribution where they reach about 50%. And that is uh, surprising, I think, to many of us. About the small scale sector in, in, uh, in particular, we know that we have a problem of, of data. Very often there's a lack of awareness because of uh, the lack of uh, organization in the sector, for example, and there's a lack of political attention to the sector for that very reason. We have some studies, for example, from the World Bank that show that overall engagement in the sector are about 120 million uh, people, including part-time. Uh, almost all of these are in developing countries, but we should remember that small scale sector is important also in the Mediterranean, for example, in Norway, in Iceland, Canada. So it's not only a developing country issue, uh, but even though most of the people engaged in the sector are in the developing world. Most of these are also in the small scale sector, of course. And we know that 50% of the catches in the developing world come from the small scale sector. So it's very important, not only in terms of employment, but also in terms of its supply of products, not only to domestic consumption, but also to international trade. Well, we've spoken about the, the fish, we've spoken about the people, we've spoken about the small scale sector, but we also have to mention why certification has become such an issue. And the most important reason for this is, of course, the state of stocks. And we have seen a worrying trend in the number of stocks being overfished. And the number of stocks that is now considered overfished is more than 30%. Uh, in, in fact, it has reached 30%, 31%. And that is, of course, a very uh, large uh, reason for concern. And that is also why certification has become such an important issue in trying to correct that. If we look uh, at the history of certification within FIO, we've seen a tremendous development over the last uh, decades, in fact. And I remember personally in the 1990s when the debate started, there was a lot of opposition and resistance, especially from developing countries, against debating the issue, because many countries felt that cert certificates or eco labels would, uh, would, would come into being and be uh, barriers to trade. So it took some time to get a consensus among the international community that certification also has its positive, positive, um, positive um, or, or benefits and could in fact help producers. Uh, FAO got the mandate to develop guidelines for certification and you probably know that we have three sets of guidelines for capture fisheries, for inland capture fisheries, for marine capture fisheries and now also for aquaculture. 
And one recent development is the establishment of the GSSI, the Global um, Seafood Sustainable Initiative, with its benchmarking tool, which builds exclusively on FAO instruments and other instruments that have been uh, negotiated internationally. So not only FAO instruments, but other instru instruments as well that have been officially and, and publicly established by the international community on the governmental side. Now, the main challenge today is how to enable small-scale producers to obtain certification. We mentioned already by, by Volker in the introduction that to some extent it has been so far a, a developed country phenomenon, but that is changing. It's been a change in, in, in the perception and the uh, potential of uh, benefits of, of certification and therefore small-scale producers and developing country producers in particular are looking to certification as a means to achieve market access. And in the future, of course, this will just continue to grow, but we also have seen that the parameters, the criteria that are being uh, benchmarked and that are being certified are changing. And we see that the issue of social conditions within the sector has become more and more important uh, over the last only two, three years. And we expect that among the criteria coming up for certification, we'll see many uh, of the schemes now taking up social issues. And that is a new development. So we've seen over the last 30, 40 years that eco-labeling has developed from a single species issue uh, dealing with tuna to a mainstream issue. We've seen that the manufacturers or the processors, the exporters in the beginning saw certification as a means to uh, getting maybe a price premium, to achieving a market access, and that is still the case. But the discussion and the focus has evolved into becoming much more sophisticated. In fact, as many more markets now are uh, looking for products that are certified and many more products and species are being certified. We've also seen that businesses look towards certification, not as a market or not exclusively as a market uh, entry or market access issue anymore, but also as a, or as a basis for product differentiation. But it's an issue uh, how to uh, manage the risk within the company, the reputational risk, how to uh, show the retailers that they are looking towards uh, certifying the whole uh, value chain that they know the suppliers that know that the conditions under which the fish or the products have been produced the working conditions etc have been looked upon and have been certified and have been found to be in compliance so not just entering the market anymore it's a much more holistic approach I mentioned some of the uh, eco-labeling guidelines within FAO. Of course, these are linked to the, the Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries. And uh, I must say, uh, they have all been agreed by consensus by the world community within the FAO. And that is a very important uh, thing to, to note. We also had the very recent, uh, the voluntary guidelines for small-scale fisheries that came into being just a few years ago. And for the first time, we saw a negotiated international instrument entirely or exclusively dedicated to small-scale fisheries. And that's a tremendous breakthrough also in terms of awareness of, of the sector. I mentioned the GSSI and of course GSSI builds on, on, on the principles of FAO and the benchmarking tool that was launched in 2015 has now benchmarked a number of the most important schemes in, uh, that we find in, in the world market. There are also some interesting developments. Uh, the GSSI has been included in the TUNA 2020 declaration and also in the sourcing guidelines for the next Summer Olympics in, uh, in Tokyo. And that, of course, is a very welcome uh, development also because, as we are, are proud of in the FAO, that it builds on FAO guidelines. I mentioned already that the uh, debate on certification has, has evolved. Um, there is a growing importance of certification and links to traceability. Um, the issue now is how to engage and how to ensure that the small scale sector and the artisanal sector are able to, uh, to take part and get their uh, products and their fisheries certified. Um, we know that this is not easy. Uh, we know that there, of course, uh, is a very large cost element here, which prohibits, to some extent, very often the small-scale uh, fishers and agriculture farmers to uh, to certify. There are a number of ways out of this. Uh, cluster certification is one of them, 
and we'll have some examples later on in the webinar showing how local communities have dealt with the issue. I mentioned uh, already that uh, in the evolve evolving debate, uh, the issue of uh, sustainability has, has gone beyond that of focusing entirely on the environmental uh, issue, but also going more and more towards the social issue. And we will see that in, in the future. We've already seen it so far, but we all have also seen the debate, for example, within the GSSI and other schemes that are looking towards uh, including social criteria. And in that respect, uh, you may wish to know that this year in November, the, uh, con the ILO Convention 188 that deals with uh, labor conditions in the fishery sector will come into being one year after the rectification of the 10th country that joined this agreement. So there are a number of positive um, developments also in, in terms of getting your certification on labor conditions, so social conditions within the sector. To conclude, a growing share of fish supply, around 15%, but growing, has now been certified. That there are a number of FAO guidelines for eco-labeling and also how to support developing countries in achieving uh, certification, but also uh, how to set up their own national schemes should they wish to do so. That the GSSI tool builds on FAO principles and guidelines and instruments. That certification is becoming a buying requirement and risk management tool, so not just the market access or a, a, as it used to be, but the number of challenges that remain. Um, the first one is how to ensure that in developing countries and small scale sector can achieve certification should they wish to do so. And of course, how to improve the fisheries that are to be certified to enable those fisheries to uh, achieve certification. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Odin, um, for, your, for your presentation. And uh, without much further, uh, without much further questions, I will uh, announce Camila Zambrano Esguerra. Uh, Camila works as environmental coordinator in Fondo Acción, a Colombian-based NGO. She's especially interested in sustainable development and value chain and impact assessment, and has lots of experience in project man management execution of international agreements and cooperation funds, and analysis of impact and opportunities. Before joining Fondo Acción, Camila worked in alternative development projects with the United Nations in Colombia with the Agriculture Ministry and BSD Consulting in traditional crop, crops, fisheries, art craft, and conservation projects. Camila obtained her bachelor in Colombia as agro-industrial production engineer and holds an MSc in Agricultural Development Economics from the University of Reading in the UK. Camilla, please go ahead. Thank you, Volker, and thank you for the invitation. So, as you said, um, I work in fisheries uh, for a few years. Uh, um, do you Camilla, want me to share the Yeah, excuse me, please accept, yeah, show your presentation, please. Um, you need, yeah, duplica presentación. Do you have it already? No. Nope. Opción de, yeah, duplicar. That yeah, one. but it, it doesn't show up. Just touch it. Okay. right now yes Perfect. that's good thanks okay so right now i'm gonna show you the program eco gourmet that is an approach to work with a small scale fishermen on responsible fisheries and fair and competitive business model with restaurants and distribution as a solution for a sustainable uh, ecosystem this program is made with the with an alliance of Conservación Internacional Colombia and Fondo Acción, as Volker mentioned. Just to have a little background of Colombia, we have two coasts, and 
both of them are really important, but 80% of the production or the capture is made in the Pacific coast. Where are we in the program? The fish consumption in Colombia, I, I think that we have a lack of uh, information here, but as FAO reports in the last um, inform or document that has made in Latin America in 2016 is about six kilo, kilograms per person per year. So this is a really low consumption that doesn't move so much the market either. The production in Colombia is around 160,000 tons. That is really a low proportion of the tons that is captured in the world. We have two mechanisms in Colombia regarding the protected areas that are mainly small scale fishermen. We have 13 marine protected areas and two little mechanisms in the Pacific coast that are specific for small scales. That is one is called the CEPA that is specifically for small scales in terms of the area. And the, the, the RMI, that is an integrated platform between uh, industrial and artisan fishermen. It's around, this area is around 1 million square kilometers that uh, are possible to, to approach with the fishermen, with the small scale fishermen. The program is based in five organizations in the Pacific coast. Uh, you can see in the map, there are between the low part of the Nariño department through the Chocó at the north. Uh, those communities are basically um, organizations that has more or less 20 to 100 associated. Fisherman. The program is basically made with uh, these blocks, building blocks, that are five building blocks in terms of the organizations. We have three components that are the best practices for fishing, manufacturing, and storage the product. Also, the organization empowerment that is quite of the biggest challenge. Uh, to actually do some administrative and accounting with the organizations and encourage them to have a transparency process between the, the leaders and the fishermen. And the third one in terms of the organization is the fair agreements in which we connect the organizations with the market, especially with the restaurants in this case. And from the client part or the consumer part, we work in two main building blocks. There are the consumer sensitization, that is regarding the campaigns or the placemats or different uh, workshops that we made with the restaurants to get more customers responsible or at least a consciousness about what they are eating and also the the strategy in communications in which the Blue Solution has been a platform for it. The business model that we work on is uh, connecting directly the small scale fisherman organizations with restaurants. And right now we have four restaurants in Bogota and one in Cali that is also a main city for Colombia. We have around 878 families in the organizations. Uh, that is like 10% uh, of the fishermen in the Pacific coast. Um, this model, what I look for is to have a fair and competitive business model in which all can win for the process and all, all can have a win-win situation. The impact in the first phase that we have it um, with Marviva and um, Walk and the restaurant Walk in Bogota, it's about 600,000 customers. So the place met and, and, and participate in, in this communication strategy 
to actually know the criteria of responsible fisheries and responsible uh, consumption. Less capture was made for the same value of the of the fish. That means that the fisherman get, got a better income from per fresh fish. This is important because we, as a program, as a co-gourmet program, we are dealing with fresh fish, basically, not, not a freeze it. In the second phase, we have made some progress and the fish is sold around 17 to 24% more above the normal price. Uh, the fishermen actually have adopted the responsible fishing criteria and the cold chain was maintained perfectly, so they have done, done the technical assistance well. And eight new restaurants are interested in the, in the program and three new species are sold in the restaurants. And this is also an, a good challenge for the program because we want to get the restaurants, get more different species uh, in the menu. Some of the reflections or challenges that we see and we have in mind is uh, the cooperative needs, needs to deliver a minimum volume. So the logistics uh, made a bit easier than right now. Also the commercial relationships or the, we need to improve the relations and the quality of the, of the product uh, to have a fair price during the year or during a long-term relations. The, and we encourage also the fishing communities to, to improve relations in local markets because everyone thinks that, that uh, the local market are not uh, interested as the national market or the, for, uh, or, or the main cities. So we need to improve that also in the quality. The, um, the monetary and, and evaluate process from the organizations and from the restaurants to actually meet the criteria and, and do these kind of presentations with, the, with results. The, uh, another issue is the packing material because we have to get back the, the freezers or the coolers that we use during the logistic part. Um, reflections that are actually are like next steps are that we have to have a schedule in terms of the uh, delivery dates with the restaurants. We are uh, developing a new ABC of the Eco Gourmet program in which we can invite a new organizations and distributors. Uh, in that sense, we need an, a distributor in Bogota or in Cali to actually do the retail sales for the for the social society and also have an agreement a commitment agreement to stay in the program every year and that in that sense will be kind of a certification in terms of uh, met the criteria of the program thank you very much here are the details of the organizations in colombia Thank you very much, uh, Camilla. That was really interesting. And I'm going to try and show my screen now. Yes. And uh, I would like to present to you our next speaker, Hoyt Peckham. Uh, Hoyt is the founding director of the Smartfish Group, a social enterprise that incentivizes more sustainable artisanal fishing in Mexico. He is also a Pew Marine Fellow, a visiting fellow at Stanford University Center for Ocean Solutions, a member of the IUCN Marine Turtle Specialist Group, that's how we met, by the way, and consults internationally on augmenting fishery sustainability. He has co-developed fishery solutions with many marine resource users of Latin America, the Northwest Atlantic, the Caribbean, Polynesia, and Japan. Hoyt earned his PhD in evolutionary ecology from the University of California at Santa Cruz and has resided in Mexico for the past 15 years. So Hoyt, please go ahead.
Great, thank you, Volker. Uh, and uh, it's an honor to share. Uh, whoa, I'm on the wrong slide. Give you guys a little preview there. Um, it's uh, it's an honor uh, for the chance to share, especially among such such good company as Aden, Camila, and Daniel, and of course Volker. Um, I'm going to talk about the solution we've created for Mexican artisanal fisheries, specifically to address two fundamental problems that we face here. Um, on the one hand, in Baja California, like much of the developing world, artisanal fishermen, like Luis Angel, are trapped in a vicious cycle of overfishing due primarily to lack of market access and predatory intermediaries. And this is gutting Luis Angel's and other artisanal fishermen's livelihoods and communities. On the other hand, the problem shared by everyone from Mexican consumers to international retailers that due to seafood fraud, consumers like Fernanda and Ismael, young professionals from Mexico City who happen to be pregnant, can't be sure what their seafood is, where it's from, whether it was caught or processed by uh, slaves or indentured or bonded, uh, you know, bonded servitude, or whether it is safe for Fernanda and her baby to eat. We built the Smart Fish Group to a social enterprise consisting of both nonprofit and commercial branches to solve these two problems um, using both a, a, a nonprofit and a commercial branch to create new domestic markets for both supply and demand of sustainable seafood, basically by connecting Luis Angel with Francisco and their respective markets. Uh, I think it's especially um, opportune to be uh, presenting just after Camila, the Walk Eco Gourmet uh, Fondacion model is something that uh, we've uh, been inspired by uh, in developing this. And uh, it's obviously a different context, but a lot of similarity in, in how we've, uh, we've moved. So uh, I, I think that's especially uh, uh, nice to be uh, sharing together. So uh, I'll present uh, following the panorama, uh, the Blue Solutions model, I'll present uh, a series of building blocks. The first one that I'll share is this fishery selection process. So our nonprofit branch selects fishing groups based on some very clear criteria that we developed based on empirical research that's out there and also our own experience in the sector here. The first one is that we uh, are working only with uh, groups of fishers that have effective institutional structure, such as a co-op or an association that is strong, transparent, democratically run that also has formally and formerly adopted sustainability measures of some kind. So they have made a commitment to sustainability, environmental and or social. Uh, and also that uh, this group is focusing on biologically resilient uh, species. And uh, these three pieces are quite important, we found in uh, our development of the model, we, we started with a, a different kind of approach back in 2009, 2010, and came up against uh, a couple of these issues. Uh, specifically, probably the most problematic one for us was uh, trying to work with groups of fishers that weren't well organized. Uh, that becomes an insurmountable challenge as we try to help them uh, build their businesses better. The second building block is um, monitoring and evaluation. We developed a, an impact department within SmartFish NGO to uh, assess the performance of the groups and the fisheries that we're working with. We use on the social side, uh, basically the fair trade fishery standard that we've modified to uh, this national context. On the environmental side, we use the MSC standard and on, uh, in terms of business or enterprise performance, we use pretty basic uh, um, or standard business analytics. The outputs that we look for from this uh, impact department are to understand the past, current, and potential performance across these three dimensions of uh, groups that we're working with, to identify deficiencies and opportunities, and then to in turn 
either um, decide not to uh, partner or in the case that things look, uh, it looks like a situation that we can help with to design our value rescue intervention based on that. Um, we brought together a team of professionals, uh, not just the usual biologists that uh, I've found are often trying to work on these kinds of things, but we brought together fisheries engineers, uh, business consultants, social scientists, and there are a couple biologists among us too. <laughs> um, the third building block is this uh, NGO structure, uh, which we use to incubate st these strong co-ops uh, to improve their, um, their practices. We offer them technical assistance and basically help them run BIPs, if you will, that is business improvement projects. So uh, we help responsible fishers like Luis Hanhel and their co-ops rescue the value of their catch by upgrading the quality, food safety, and sustainability levels to produce a premium product um, that is food safety certified, that is more sustainable and independently verified as such or in a FIP, and in exchange for and conditioned upon their superior social and environmental performance. Let's see. The fourth block is a um, the for-profit branch that we created to serve as a good intermediary, consolidating and differentiating their catch into preferential markets, rewarding them for their investments in sustainability. Uh, it also functions as a proof of concept to demonstrate the advantages of transparency and traceability, specifically throughout the seafood supply chain. Uh, in our case, we're now selling uh, this uh, high quality, more sustainable seafood into four channels, uh, uh, national retailers, gourmet restaurants, uh, eco-tour cruise ships, and also uh, we're starting to experiment with uh, direct marketing through online uh, distributors. In terms of our impact, um, we're looking for true triple impact. And so far, our solution has yielded uh, a variety of impacts. In general terms, fishers like Luis Angel can earn considerably more, 30% on average, catching fewer fish, increasing sustainability, eliminating wildlife bycatch, while women and other family members can earn new wages processing their catch locally. Uh, another impact that uh, we feel is quite important is on the consumer side. So people like Fernanda plus chefs and corporate buyers now have access to safe and responsible seafood. Our solution of course requires assorted enabling conditions which I'll run through quickly. Among others, fisheries management needs to be sound. This requires, model requires uh, philanthropic support Fishing groups, as I mentioned in the beginning, are first criteria that are empowered. So where they aren't, uh, those groups require external support that, that we're not uh, focusing on providing to build up their social and environmental performance. Informed consumers, that's something that we feel we can help move, as, um, as uh, Camila was mentioning, that they've achieved in Colombia. And then this system also requires, requires third-party evaluation and certification. Um, specifically because we, because of our hybrid model, we can't be uh, self-certifying because our for-profit branch ends up selling this fish. If our nonprofit side was actually self-certifying, uh, that wouldn't quite work. Which brings me to the topic of the webinar. Some quick observations uh, that actually were, many of which were touched on by Fulker and Auden. I won't go into too much detail. But just a couple of them. One is that, uh, as was mentioned, uh, certification at this point is so expensive that it's really only relevant in the developing world artisanal fisheries for export luxury seafood items. That leaves the grand majority of production outside of that uh, realm. So some opportunities that we found for addressing that are getting local, getting evaluations done locally and regionally putting our seafood into FIPS until costs can come down. In other words, for instance, uh, some of the existing standards or, or certification models 
are just way too expensive and not quite appropriate for our context. So we wouldn't try and push any of the fishers we work with into one of the certifications at this point. But we are uh, in FIPS with them. And we hope that within four or five years, the life cycle of those FIPS, that those costs will come down and we'll be able to co-develop uh, certification systems that are more appropriate for these uh, domestic markets. Um, and finally, we feel that there's a big opportunity in making the uh, these kinds of labels much more, giving them much more traction by focusing on social impact along with environmental impact. Really quickly, I want to recognize uh, our support and uh, I think I'll finish there and uh, look forward to questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hoyt. And um, yeah, this is uh, a really, really nice solution, I think. And uh, I've been with it for for a while because I also worked in Mexico for a long time. Um, OK. And following up now, it's my pleasure to announce Daniel Sudeby. Daniel is policy director at Ocean Outcomes, or O2 where he is responsible for expanding O2's portfolio of work, policies, and strategies, and working closely with uh, the regional program teams to promote sustainable fishery management policies. Before he worked to O2, with O2, he spent six years at World Wildlife Fund, and this uh, solution, his talk, is actually about his work at WWF. And there he coordinated WWF's global engagement in tuna fisheries and provided strategic direction on their seafood engagement strategy. Before he also worked as a senior fishery certification manager for the Marine Stewardship Council, MSC, where he played a key role to strengthen and implement the MSC fisheries assessment program. Daniel holds a BSc in biology from Royal Holloway from the University of London and a Master's of Science in Conservation from University College in London. And he loves to climb and hike and uh, has come to work in marine conservation and fisheries out of a deep, uh, a deep feeling for marine life and the sea. So Daniel, please go ahead. Many thanks for that introduction, Volker, and um, it's uh, good to be talking um, amongst such uh, other great presenters who we've heard today. Um, let me start my presentation. Let me just check if you can see that okay. Yep, it yes. works a bit slow. Okay, so I'll talk slowly. Um, so. Um, Volker gave me an introduction, and I'm going to be talking about how a small-scale fishery can drive ocean-level change with some of the building blocks that we've talked about today. So I'm kind of moonlighting because I work for Ocean's Outcome, but really this solution was due to the work of WWF, the Maldives government, and the International Hold and Line Foundation. So what I'm going to focus on is how those building blocks of, of market incentivization, certification, and advocacy can work to transform tuna management for the benefit of all the fishers, so not just the small scale, um, but also the, the larger fisheries. But the driver for change here was a small scale fishery. So, so everyone understands the, the picture. I'm going to give you some background. So in the middle of the Indian Ocean, on the Chagos Lakdev Plateau, is a series of um, coral atolls um, that form the um, country of the Maldives. So after tourism, which the Maldives is famous for, the second biggest industry and biggest employer is the fishery sector. So these are small boats, um, about 90 foot long, crew of about 20 um, individuals on them, going out and fishing with a hole and line technique uh, for tuna, mainly skipjack, but also some yellowfin. They're fishing in the EZ mainly of Maldives and um, are uh, forming a revenue of about 
60 uh, million US dollars a year, so uh, about 3% of the GDP of Maldives. And the government is really keen to secure a long-term and profitable future for one of their key constituents, the fishermen. And of course, you can't uh, graze or have any other form of protein on these um, atolls. So the tuna species forms the basis of the daily protein intake for most of the people of the Maldives. And really, uh, through this story, the key building block and an important one has been to have a very uh, engaged uh, government, um, engaged in wanting to uh, uh, drive sustainability for the fishing sector. And of course, this is not always the case. So it's a, a prerequisite to some of this work. So in order to improve the um, management of the fishery, because of the nature of the skipjack uh, stocks, you have to work at the Indian Ocean level. So uh, the Indian Ocean is um, unique in all of the different tuna areas in that it has the highest percentage of developing coastal states. So other fishes of those skipjack stocks include the Persane fisheries of uh, mainly European owned vessels, longline um, uh, fishers, mainly from Indonesia, and a huge amount, about a third of the fleet, are small um, scale artisanal fisheries, mainly using gill nets and fishing from Pakistan, Iran, and a little from Sri Lanka. This whole uh, fishery is managed uh, by the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, that's the uh, Tuna RFMO. And when I started this work in 2011, there was no effective control uh, in place for any of the stocks which the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission managed. In addition to the management system, we had a large amount of NGO presence in the area, which greatly helped and was one of the key building blocks. As well as uh, forming uh, daily proteins, um, the skipjack was exported from the Maldives to Europe, where a large amount of uh, NGO presence has meant that there's a very sensitive uh, consumer interest in eco-labeling, particularly MSC. So that's the background. And you can see a little, all of the building blocks here were in 2011 to attempt to improve a small scale fishery and to drive change at the ocean level. So kind of something unique. So we had a clear barrier to certification. There was no management in place. We had a strong demand for certified product, that's the European market. And we had a great NGO network and capacity within the region and within the market region. So when I started this work, I would assume that we would, WDS role would simply be to nurture um, and the demand from the um, uh, retail sector and to help push um, the harvest control at the IOTC and eventually uh, result in MSC certification. And then last year uh, in La Réunion, a small volcanic island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, we had some success. So we had a conservation impact. There was an agreement to reduce catches when science dictates. So this is what um, the work had been pushing for, the harvest control. And this is a global first for a sustainably managed, for a um, healthy stock of tuna. It's about a million tons of skipjack. So the uh, scientific um, control put in place benefited that whole stock, which is the second biggest tuna fishery in the world. And as I said, has the highest number of developing coastal states and therefore small scale fisheries fishing upon them. So it sounds kind of neat um, and a, a simple story, but like all stories, not, not so simple. Um, so it looked like our plan worked and it was successful and it did work, but I wanted to share with you uh, some of the areas we worked on to get there that weren't as um, simple as that flow. So the, the first uh, challenge we had was in 2012. The um, fishery was certified much to our surprise um, because there was no management in place at the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. So WF had really engaged very heavily during the certification process and eventually objected to this fishery, which is a process within the MSC system, like a judicial challenge. In the end, we uh, kind of settled out of court. So WF agreed to um, 
allow move forward with the certification as we didn't feel this was the uh, fault of the Maldives fishery. Um, in fact, was a problem with the certification system. So we, as part of that negotiation, we negotiated very tight conditions of certification to improve. And it's these certifications, these uh, conditions of certification, which ultimately were driving the, the change over the next four years. In addition to this, in order to get agreement from the Indian Ocean countries, we um, uh, delivered a series of capacity building exercises. So this is one of the third building block, the capacity building. So uh, WWF and FAO, on behalf of Jeff under the ABNJ project, carried out a series of um, capacity building exercises, uh, building, pulling together some of those North Indian Ocean coastal states and getting them to understand different aspects of sustainability. In 2014, we managed to pull together more uh, participants from developing coastal states in these meetings than were attending the IOTC meeting. So we were getting a really good turnout and we were able to build capacity and understanding with sustainable fisheries management. And in 2016, in that final year in the run-up to um, uh, use a small scale fishery to put pressure on a international system, we had some direct market advocacy. So we worked with some of the big names in retail and processing and canning to put some strong messages towards the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission that there must be effective harvest control uh, in place. And finally, uh, in the short run up to the meeting itself, the ITC meeting, we um, pushed very hard, um, very publicly, uh, a clear message is that you could not be certified without having effective management in place. So that's the overall picture and then some of the, the, the details and the, the challenges we faced. And then just some reflections and to, to summarize and bring it back to um, Panorama's solutions. The first really exciting thing I think is that international change can happen, particularly with tuna. And we heard often over the last five or six years that that was an impossibility that you couldn't change an RFMO and here we have a great case study of a small island state um, with the help of various players pushing change. So the situation in the Maldives although not unique was unusual and we've kind of uh, focused on some of those aspects and you must have all of those building blocks in place in order to drive that kind of change. The second really reflection is that it really needed a strategic and directed work over a four year period. So this was a, a team of uh, four people working on it directly in a larger network of, of 200 individuals. But it needed to be coordinated and we needed to use our tools from certification, capacity building and communications um, in, a, in a smart way. Uh, the final reflection is it really needed a robust standard to drive change. So we had a huge amount of intensity of, of resources on ensuring that the MSC standard were applied cor correctly. And really, ultimately, that was unsustainable by WWF and maybe unsustainable in, in other certifications. So that's it. I wanted to reflect what I said at the beginning, that there's not ocean outcomes work which are focused on fishery improvement projects but this was really the work of WWF, the Maldives government and the International Polar and Line Foundation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, Daniel for your really interesting presentation and um, so now it's question and answer time. Uh, I think we have had a pretty wide uh, array of uh, scales and and examples. So I'm really thankful to our presenters uh, for giving us uh, such insights on on their particular lines of work and for Auden for the keynote. So we can start with a few questions that we already got in. I have one question. Um, that's maybe best for Auden. Uh, so Auden, how do you think, how viable is certification for small scale fisheries in development countries 
that produce only for domestic consumption? Well, I, I think um, what I learned from some of the uh, presentations that followed mine was uh, the importance of domestic markets. And that is something um, that we very often do not, um, well, of course, we think about it, but we talk a lot about international trade, international markets, we talk about Japan, EU, US, etc. But in fact, when you look at where consumption in the world is growing um, really quickly now, it's in the developing countries. So it's domestic consumption, and the domestic consumption in the developing world is really very often what is also driving uh, aquaculture production in many of these countries. And uh, consumers evolve, uh, and we see more and more that also consumers in developing countries look towards some type of certification, some, some sort of assurance, uh, both for the quality, of course, from the quality and safety perspective, but also that the fish that they buy, whether it's in the local market or in the supermarket, come from sustainably managed um, resources. Now, how to ensure a formal certification process? Well, I think uh, both Hoyt and Camilla and, and Daniel showed that that is not easy. I alluded to, to the cost issue. But I think that uh, there are a number of initiatives, uh, such as the programs that have been uh, shown, there are regional initiatives in terms of regional certification uh, schemes. There is the cluster alternative. So I think each country has to find its own model or different models that can, can work together. What is important is, of course, to uh, provide uh, safe and sustainably managed or, and, and harvested food to consumers, whether they are in developing countries or in developed countries. And we've seen a number of ways of achieving that. What is uh, perfectly uh, clear is that we will not see the traditional schemes sort of coming into the developing world as much as we would like to, uh, and that is a cost issue. But it's also a, cost, uh, a question of volume. But long term, I think we'll see a number of different ways of, of certifying products also in the domestic markets in the developing countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arden. Um I have a small question to Camilla. The um, the price premium that the restaurants pay for the products that's marketed with the Eco Gourmet Initiative. Have you had done interviews to with the consumers and with the uh, restaurant owners? Do they pay more because of the more sustainable uh, catch techniques, uh, or do they pay more because the product simply is? much better because the value chain uh, was uh, maintained perfectly well over time. There's there's the two options, no? First, because they are part of the program, they are willing to pay more for the social standpoint and the environmental point. But also in terms of the quality, they have seen that uh, with the logistic and with the fresh feed, fish product in, in their restaurants, it's a better quality for them too. Okay, thanks very much, Camilla. And I have a question for uh, for Hoyt. Hoyt, uh, how do you collect data? Is it uh, electronic? Are you uploading into a cloud database? Or how does it work? Do you have a software for that? And if yes, is it open source? Hoyt, you're muted. I think. Hello, <laughs> sorry. I think I was externally muted from that before. Thank you, Volker. Uh, yes, so uh, data collection now, uh, we are actually Cecilia Blasco, uh, who is the executive director of our of Smartfish NGO, is uh, out in the field this week, uh, isolated Isla Natividad, installing a, a, a a traceability system that was developed and provided by Insight Solutions. Um, that's very exciting because that uh, digitizes the whole process of, of uh, data collection uh, of everything from catch to through processing, through transport. And uh, so in the past, until now, we've been using a combination of uh, analog and uh, digital collection and uh, moving forward, uh, this will be, uh, for the most part, uh, completely digital. 
and um, we're developing with Inside Solutions a, a platform, a traceability um, platform that will be accessible by um, people participating in the, in the supply chain. And we're considering doing a uh, consumer-facing piece of that as well. I'm not sure if that's what that person asking was looking for, but uh, we'd be happy to share uh, how we've uh, how we've developed that. And then I just wanted to add to the question of or the comments of Camila on, on price. In our case, we've seen very little uh, interest in paying more for uh, environmental uh, improvement or, or performance. Some interest expressed, but not actually done yet because, uh, well, for a variety of reasons on social performance. But the big uh, reason that people, um, especially institutional buyers, are willing to pay more has been uh, quality and food safety certification uh, in our case. Okay, cool. Thank you, Hoyt. And uh, I have another question for Daniel. Daniel, how do you come overcome political pressure uh, from other commercial fisheries? that are sometimes competing with the artisanal fisheries and often get the support of the government in developing countries. Um, maybe you have a Western Indian Ocean perspective on that? Uh, yeah, the, the, the situation maybe with Skipjack was quite unique. And um, one of the things that made it easier is the stock was not depleted. So there wasn't um, a fight for a share of the stock. And I think that, that helped a lot because um, what it meant was that the um, negotiation wasn't fighting over the, the, the last piece of the pie, and so it could be a bit more flexible. Um, how it was carried out in this case was there were the European organizations were indeed feeding the European market and keen to be certified. So they could see that the barrier to certification, the adoption of harvest control rules was critical. So despite um, in the margins, uh, fighting, uh, everyone was relatively aligned um, to move things forward with regards to harvest control rule. Um, so there isn't this them versus us situation of distant water fleets and um, uh, developing coastal states. And in fact, some of the developing coastal states in the, the Indian Ocean um, flag, uh, flag European vessels. So it's not quite as divisive as you see in um, other uh, oceans. Okay, um, thank you very much, Daniel. And another question um, for for Hoyt, maybe. Uh, Hoyt, how do you ensure that price premiums for products really flow down the chain to reach the fishermen and is not totally absorbed by middlemen? I think you partially explained that for the Smartfish case, and maybe you can give a two-pronged answer, one for Smartfish and um, maybe also a different approach if you have an idea. Great, thank you, Fokker. Yeah, in our case with um, with fisheries that we are using the full solution on, that is uh, the NGO increasing the, you know, going through this value rescue process. When a fishery reaches uh, market readiness, they have the choice to sell through uh, Smartfish Incorporated or to, do, to go through other channels. And one of the ways that we uh, strive to help them um, understand what proportion of the value chain they are owning is to insist on uh, transparency and traceability with whomever, whatever intermediary they're working with. So the first prong in the case of if they're selling through Smartfish Incorporated, the books are all open and we uh, require that through the final buyer. So that um, if, for instance, when we're selling into a, a, a national retailer such as uh, Sam's Club, that we want the fishers to know what the margins are for everybody. Um, and obviously consumers as well if they if they're uh, if they come looking for the information we feel that's really important um, one thing we don't I think the eco gourmet it's an incredible model of disintermediation it's fantastic uh, and we we have explored that and look forward to doing 
more of that uh, complete disintermediation in which uh, fishermen are selling directly to uh, to restaurants or to consumers. But also, uh, we found that the volume that can be sold through that channel, at least in Mexico at this point, is, is relatively limited. Whereas, as coming back to Arden's comment, uh, there's really robust, robust domestic demand for seafood within Mexico. Uh, and we're really excited to, to uh, work through these existing uh, intermediated channels like uh, retail, food service, this kind of thing, because that's where a lot of the volume is and where a lot of this artisanal seafood can be, can be placed. Um, so that's the first prong in our case. In the second case, uh, we uh, look through our NGO to help fishermen negotiate uh, transparency and hopefully be able to insist on traceability uh, with other intermediaries. None at this point offer that. Uh, that's kind of why we had to form the for-profit branch. We didn't intend to get into the business of slinging fish at all, but uh, we were faced with this dearth of good intermediaries out there uh, and feel that it's pretty uh, fundamental that, that uh, especially for artisanal fisheries, that, uh, that they can sell with transparency and traceability. Uh, so we look forward to, to helping something we may expand into is uh, facilitating this process, helping existing intermediaries develop traceability systems and help them open their books. Um, that's uh, a heavy lift, we know, uh, probably quite naive, mm -hmm. because as we know, a lot of the profit made is, is uh, in seafood, is made through the very opacity that the traceability uh, uh, gets rid of. So a lot of people won't want to move in that direction too quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Hoyt. Um, so the next question, uh, for Arden is if I can find it. Yeah, Arden, uh, how do you think uh, we can address uh, food safety, food security in a developing country contracts while still making money? In many of these examples, certified fish is possible by getting a price premium maybe. Uh, but usually this cash flow comes from export markets. So the results in fish going out of the local regions to feed others rather than the local population. Um, is, do you think there is any way to resolve that problem? Well, this is an old issue and an old uh, argument uh, which comes up again and again. And uh, it's not only a question that is related to fish, but to food in general. And I think uh, it's fairly easy to to show that uh, on 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 the overall on, on the whole um, the export by uh, generating export revenues in in terms of uh, of foreign currency benefits the country more than it would uh, if if the uh, exported goods were uh, were consumed locally and for for many reasons one reason of course is that the um, the ability and willingness to pay locally very often, but not always, very often, is much lower than that of, of export markets. Uh, another issue, of course, and another reason is that much of what is exported would not have been uh, caught or, or produced in the first place, especially if we talk about aquaculture. Uh, so export-driven aqu aquaculture is something that has sort of uh, driven the expansion in the uh, aquaculture sector. But as I alluded to in my, in my uh, previous remark, if we talk about aquaculture specifically, what is driving aquaculture now is not export-related production, but uh, the domestic market. So certainly the domestic markets that are very often willing to pay just as much as the exporting markets, or a little bit less, but you have less cost in terms of, of export levies or whatever, or transportation costs. So uh, many producers find that they have the most profitable uh, markets uh, locally. And I think it's also fair to say that very often one has neglected the ability of pay to pay in the domestic market and with purchasing power on the average increasing, the willingness to pay and the uh, willingness and interest in consuming more fish has led domestic market to, to flourish. But I'd like to come back to the remark related to, uh, to price premiums. Very often there is no price pre premium, 
So uh, what the uh, so how can then the the producers benefit? Well, very often it's through uh, taking better care of the fish, so letting more of the fish that they actually ca uh, catch um, go to to the market rather than losing it through attrition or, or waste, and also uh, getting a better price not of the product but as a, into higher quality uh, segments of, of the market. So not a price premium as such to the same consumers, but all targeting better paying segments within the local population and then reducing waste. And waste can have two forms. You can have waste in terms of spoilage or volume, but you can also have waste in terms of quality that you have to downgrade the quality and therefore the price of the product. So there are several ways that you can add, add to this and, and therefore sort of gaining more additional value. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Odin. Um, next question is comes from Indonesia and uh, goes to Camilla. Um, Indonesia is an archipelago country, and almost every coastal area has small-scale fishery. The challenge is uh, there for data collection because fish landings are not only in one place, but there are multiple uh, landing sites and uh, nobody can really control the catch, so the size, which species are there, uh, which gear is being used. Do you uh, have any suggestions how to uh, manage this case or what to focus on, Camilla? Well, yes, we have the same problem here in Colombia. And basically what we have done with the organizations is to make them aware to register in their own a format we we have done like a book or like a notebook in which they can register each of them the the capture of the day by each la a boat or or fisherman uh, we we cannot rely on the on the government to actually do this registration so we we have done a lot of capacity building in that sense for the organizations to be aware of the registration and the data collection. Okay, thank you very much, Camilla. And I have another question uh, for Daniel, uh, which is half comment, half question. So um, it says, I believe the malady skipjack fishery you presented on has a dual MSC Fairtrade USA certification that IPNL endorsed too. If this is the case, could you please expand a bit more on this case study? Um, I, I can't really. I, I think it does have a fair trade certification, but while I was at WF, we were not involved with this. Um, my understanding is they're trialing uh, WF, uh, sorry, uh, the fair trade U US's um, fair trade system, and they were using the um, Poland line fishery to examine that. Um, so sorry, I can't really provide more details. Okay, thank you, thank you, Daniel. Um, another question for Hoyt: uh, How cheap do you think certifications need to get before they'll be applicable for non-export fisheries that, like those you're working with? Oh, thank you. Um, well, let's see. Right now, it, an MSC pre-assessment uh, done through the traditional channels, you know, by an internationally recognized certifying body, can run up around twenty-five thousand dollars. That's a pre-assessment. The certification we haven't priced out directly, but I understand it's maybe sixty thousand dollars, and then the renewal, which I think is every two years or something like that. Uh, approaches that same level. So for a small fleet that's revenue is maybe um, maybe uh, you know about forty thousand dollars a year, those numbers are just uh, stratospheric, just way out of reach. So I couldn't put a um, a sort of uh, it'd be hard to put a a hard number on, but uh, we've made some progress with an NGO called Pronatura Noroeste that's here in Mexico that has been entered into an agreement with uh, MSC and uh, one of the certifying bodies and they are able to 
use local resources and avoid the high cost of bringing someone from Europe or the United States into the field to do the certification. And they've brought those, uh, those costs down uh, dramatically uh, to a few thousand dollars, uh, which is much more accessible. That is for the pre-assessment. Of course, that's not certification. That's a whole nother ball game, but uh, that's just to give an example. Um, that's something that's much more feasible. That pre-assessment lets us put a fishery into a uh, comprehensive FIP using the Conservation Alliance for uh, for Sustainable Seafood's definition of, of um, FIPS. And I think I mentioned in while I was speaking, we're, we're, we're hoping that within four or five years, that life cycle of, of, a, of a given FIP that uh, we'll be able to develop a, a, a domestic certification scheme. Uh, I've heard of a few in uh, Central America and another one in, uh, well, that seem to be doing something that could work um, and we're looking forward to investigating more. I also know that MSC has their Developing World Working Group, which I've been uh, asked to consult on a bit. Uh, so people are aware of this of this problem and I think um, another really important point that Audio mentioned is the importance of um, incorporating social aspects into uh, this certification because most of these fisheries impact is most uh, important in terms of their, their social performance. I think it would be a really important uh, differentiating piece uh, as I was mentioning before. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Hoyt. Maybe um, in uh, to Camilla, uh, how do you ensure the chain of custody for the products that uh, that are marketed to the restaurant? Well, we are trying to do a pilot right now in terms of traceability. Uh, we are looking for using this fish application in which we will have the the data from the fisherman in terms of like the stationary fishes that you you can capture during the year and with with the shipment or the logistic part we will have those registers made in the in the cooler to actually have those that information through the restaurant but we haven't done yet we are doing a pilot right now during this last months of the year mm -hmm. okay thanks Camilla uh, Hoyt would you like to uh, add something to it how you guys do it um, yeah a funny story we realized we needed traceability because one of the intermediaries that we started working with a couple of years ago ended up selling like three times as much a seafood watch green ranked yellowtail than we had produced that seemed like a problem <laughs> in other words they were substituting somewhere along the chain somebody was substituting other yellowtail which was probably gillnet caught dirty caught and of quite poor quality for our um, green ranked uh, yellowtail. That made it clear that we needed to uh, establish a, a comprehensive system. What uh, two ways that we did that was to launch the, the for profit, the commercializer that, that actually buys and sells that fish. And then uh, before this latest system, we were experimenting with a couple of other traceability systems that enabled us to, to track, um, you know, every, every piece of fish is individually labeled and tracked throughout the, the chain until it's passed to, uh, to the, the final buyer. Um, and we're looking forward to this new system to be able to, to do that in a um, much more uh, efficient way, automated way. Through, uh, through insight, as I was mentioning. Okay, cool. Thank you, Hoyt. And maybe uh, one last question. Um, we're approaching our time limit, and that's a general one. So uh, I don't know who would like to talk about it. So if we step a little bit away from certification, what do you guys think, or maybe would we just do a line 
um, for all of you, uh, what do you guys think would be the most cost-effective measure or measures to improve small-scale fisheries in ecological and uh, economical sustainability in the short and medium term? Any uh, ideas who would like to start? Autumn? Well, with all the with all the problems that are to be found within the small-scale sector, I think it's un, it's important to underline that these problems um, are society very often are societal problems and uh, governance problems that and so the solutions to those problems that you find within the small-scale fishery sector are, are are really outside the sector. You have governance problems, you have implementation problems, you have lack of of laws. You have, uh, you have very often a demographic uh, exp um, explosion, meaning that more and more people are attracted to fisheries uh, and therefore putting more pressure into, uh, into the sector. I think, um, of course, there's no easy way out of this. There's no one solution. Um, some of the solutions, of course, must be on the society and on the governance uh, level, so outside the sector, interlinking with, with other sectors, but also I think within the sector, you have to give more power and decision power. You have to give more tenure and, and rights to the people that actually uh, are, are, are in the sector that are the fishermen, because they are the ones that are closest to the fisheries, and they are the ones with the long-term interest in the survival of the fisheries. Uh, they are the ones that will live off the fish and, and their future generation, the children and grandchildren. So you have to involve them much more into the management of, of the fisheries. I think that is one uh, very important element and very often for political reasons the small-scale uh, operators have been neglected, they don't have uh, very much uh, electoral power and I think uh, the awareness that, that all of you and all of us are trying now to, to bring to the sector will, will help at least in, in part uh, give them more attention, give them provide more awareness and therefore also hopefully more and more solutions. But there's not one solution, certainly not. Thank you. Okay. Um, so if one more person would like to give a short uh, answer to that. Yeah, Volker. I would like to say that in terms of our program, we are looking forward to to come on board the government institutions to actually have more control on, that, on those issues. Uh, as a program, we of course we are trying to do a monitoring and evaluation of each of the organizations that we work with and with the restaurants as well to don't be uh, willing to receive any kind of fish. But definitely, we need a government institutions come on board in in this case. Okay, thank you very much, Camila, and um, with that. Um, yeah, I think we should close. I would like to uh, say we had a last minute offer also from the Marine Stewardship Council. They wanted to talk a little bit about their program for small scale fisheries in developing countries. Unfortunately, due to time and organizational constraints, we could not accommodate them. But if any of you are interested in recent developments of their certification scheme, please check out um, their developing world program on the website. Um, Blue Solutions, Panorama, we are currently updating our portfolio of fisheries and aquaculture related solutions. So um, please check out uh, our website and on the Panorama platform. And I would really, really like to thank all the presenters for their really interesting, inspiring talks and uh, for the discussion and question and answer. And I would also like to thank Sarah and Nick for making this webinar work and providing so much support and advice. And also obviously thanks to Ronja Schmidt from Blue Solutions who helped with the preparation of the webinar, running it and organizing questions and such. And finally, I would like to announce our next webinar in the series. It's called Do Data or Desires Drive MSP? marine spatial planning. It will take place on August 22nd, 2017. So um, we'll announce it formally over the next days. So please go ahead and register. Thanks to everybody for the attendance and I wish you a really nice afternoon. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.
Goodbye. Thank you.